Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're here with Frank Cespedes, the author of Sales Management That Works, How to Sell in a World That Never Stops Changing. Very excited to talk to you today, Frank. Thank you so much for joining us. Harry, very thank you for having me here. I very much appreciate it. Well, Frank, I'd love to get started. And we have so much to talk about. Obviously, enterprise sales development just has so many different topics. And you are an expert among experts. I've loved the conversations we've had so far. So a great framework for the conversation today will actually be based around the book that you've released. And we have a number of really interesting topics to ask you about today. The first that I'd love to talk about, and, and that's just from your intro, is you mentioned a number of, of things. You know what? I'm going to do one more. We'll cut in the fourth part of this. Yeah, no worries. Eric, where do you want to go first? I had three different different questions. I think questions inspiration and for the book would be good first. That's the, I knew there was a note I was missing. Great. So I'm just going to jump into the second half of that part and then I'll let them cut it together. So Frank, I'd love to ask before we dive into the specific topics of that book, what was your inspiration for writing it? Well, I basically had um, two motivations uh, in writing this book. The first one is quite honestly a professional intellectual motivation. Of all the different functions in business, sales is the most context specific. Now, when I say this, uh, I notice that most executives then say, yeah, of course, but it's amazing to me how smart, well-educated people forget this. Uh, selling software is different than selling capital goods, is different than selling professional services. Selling enterprise, you know, multi-year licensed software is different than selling SaaS. Uh, so selling depends on what you're selling. It also depends on where and to whom you're selling. Selling in North America is different than selling in Latin America, Asia, the Middle East. Yet sales is that area of business where people feel most comfortable making huge generalizations that are usually unsupported by any data, or as we say in academia, at best, N equals one data. When I sold for Oracle, when we invested in PayPal, you know, that kind of thing. So after decades of doing research about this, running a business for 10 years, uh, I wanted to write a book that says, look, this is what research does and doesn't tell you about this core activity in business. And I also think it's a particularly good time for a book like this. There is no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, and companies like yours are part of what I'm going to talk about, but there's no doubt that digital media and the sustained data revolution, which will continue throughout our lifetimes, those things are affecting buying and selling. But my reading of what most pundits say about those things, they simply misunderstand the managerial implications in sales. And I think the pandemic has raised the stakes for getting this right for both sellers and for investors. Well, and you know, you, you launch into the book in, in chapter one and really focus in on hiring, which is probably the, you know, the greatest area of of miss, if you will, or where things can go the most wrong uh, in the sales profession. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. And I also would point out that it's a very, very expensive thing to get wrong. Um, you, you know, and again, you, you've read the book, Eric, you see the data, but if you add up the amount of money that most companies spend annually on hiring, training and development, the opportunity cost inherent in getting a new hire up to full productivity in sales. If you add up that money, the number you come out with is very often as big or bigger than the largest CapEx capital expenditure decisions in the company. But hiring and sales rarely gets the same rigorous attention that buying software does. So it's not only a big deal, it's a very, very expensive deal as well. You know, you talk about getting it right. And in the introduction, actually, to your book, one of the things that you mentioned is that how 
basically top competencies have changed over the last few years. You know, the, the top competencies that people looked for in a sales team or a sales development team specifically in the past, you gave a list of a number of them, but what it came down to was essentially tasks and logistics based. It was about getting activities done. And now the competencies that you listed were more about critical thinking, about understanding what's going on in an organization and with the tasks that you're doing so you can choose intelligently what to do next. Uh, really loved that framework. And, and just why do you think that is? And can you talk about that a little bit more? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. The first is that um, the fact that the bar is rising in terms of sales competencies shouldn't surprise us. All right, this is what you should expect in any competitive enterprise. You know the old joke about the two guys who are out hunting, they, they shoot and wound a bear, the bear chases them, and one of them says, look, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. That's the way competition works, right? It's about relative advantage. And I also wanna point out something that again, once I point it out, sounds obvious, but people in business forget this. You do not compete with people who have gone out of business. The dead are dead. You only compete with the survivors in a competitive marketplace. And in order to survive in any competitive marketplace, continuous improvement is essential. So it shouldn't surprise us that the, uh, the bar is rising. Now in sales, it's rising particularly fast for a couple of reasons. One is, again, the data revolution. Sales is becoming a much more data intensive activities. So that the competencies that you refer to, Harry, that were state of the art important 10 years ago, it's not like those things have disappeared, but they're now in effect table stakes. The other competencies layered on that are increasingly important. And then the uh, third reason I think gets us back to uh, Eric's question about hiring. There have always been and still remain inherent challenges in sales hiring that simply do not exist to anywhere near the same extent in any other function. I mean, for example, if you want to hire an engineer, uh, you can go to a school and it's a little bit like walking into a food court. Well, you know, what are you interested in? Electrical engineering, chemical engineering, et cetera. If you need somebody in finance or accounting, or for that matter, a computer programmer, you can find people who majored in those subjects. But of the nearly 5,000 <clears throat> colleges and universities in the United States, the last time I looked, which was a little over two years ago when I started writing this book, less than 300 even had a sales course, let alone a sales program. Notice the implication of that. This is a profession, sales, where the vast majority of people start knowing almost nothing about what they're going to get paid for. That makes hiring tough. And in turn, it makes trying to scope out the uh, uh, required competencies even tougher in this area, precisely because they depend on the market and the market always changes. You know, what's funny about that is, <clears throat> and we see this with our own business all the time. One of the things that, you know, the SDR role in general, the sales development reps of the world are typically an entry-level job, you know, and they're typically cutting their teeth and, and the learnings definitely happen fast because it's a practicable um, discipline. But where I often find that most companies and organizations, especially with large fleets of SDRs, and this is the Enterprise Sales Development Podcast, struggle is really the lack of theory, the lack of methodology, the lack of grounding in why do anything in the program that we're doing from a sales standpoint. Yeah. No, I, I, would, uh, I would agree with that, but let's understand what that theory in turn has to be grounded on. It has to be grounded on the buying process, right? The most important thing about selling is and always has been the buyer. Who buys, why, and how? And that's, that's what's changing big time uh, because of uh, data, uh, technology, et cetera. If you don't have a good fix 
on what I like to call the customer conversion dynamic in your business, you're not going to be able to do a good job in establishing the framework in which the SDR needs to work. I would also say that especially in SaaS businesses where you know, SDRs grew up and um, uh, are most prevalent, uh, quite honestly, I don't think there's many mysteries left there. I think the playbook in a lot of SaaS businesses is reasonably well known, but as a result, it's commodifying. And as it commodifies, that puts more importance on having the right data, knowing what it is that you're asking that relatively green recruit to do. And then the third comment I'd make, Eric, and here I do want to tip my hat a bit uh, to those SaaS businesses, because they figured out before many other enterprise buyers did, and again, this links back uh, to people and hiring, they figured out that in effect, they don't need the greatest people to do every task in their sales model. We can hire these less expensive, basically inexperienced people if we can ask them to do what it is we can train them to do. And that is, you know, make a lot of calls, uh, do your best, ask a few questions that helps to qualify. And then in effect, they, in most of those models, they hand over the prospect to what I like to call adult supervision, you know, the experienced account executives. That's a lesson that I do think is disseminating throughout industry. And in fact, I think the pandemic has accelerated that insight for a lot of companies. You know, Frank, I think you just handed us a beautiful segue to one of the topics that's most near and dear to Eric's heart and my own, especially over at Science. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning of your book, all the different simultaneous paths going on when it comes to a buying decision and a buying journey now versus years ago. And you talk about how there is no funnel, there's no step one, step two, step three, it's everything at once across all the channels with different moving parts, which seems to lead right into your first chapter where you do talk about specialization. And is that why you think specialization has become so essential? Is it because of the simultaneous paths going on at the same time? Is it the complexity of reaching people across uh, more technologically advanced channels? What's leading, do you think, to, uh, to specialization becoming so essential? Well, you, you know, what I will call, you, what you're calling specialization, I'm going to use Adam Smith's old term, the division of labor. And that, I think, is something that's becoming more important and accelerating in sales for a couple of reasons. Again, always start with the buyer. You can't go too wrong in sales and marketing if you start with the buyer. And the buyer, as you pointed out, is now online and offline simultaneously and at multiple times during their buying journeys, all right? Now, this does not mean the disintermediation of the salesperson. You have the data in the book, but very briefly for our uh, listeners, use the United States as a very good example. The number of salespeople in the United States has consistently increased throughout the 21st century, even as the internet has increased in bandwidth, scope, options, et cetera. Uh, so salespeople are not going away. Uh, and by the way, that data, which you know, I get from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, is almost certainly grossly underestimated because we're in a services dominated economy. About 70% of US GDP is in services. And in most services businesses, people that do business development are not called salespeople uh, for labor department reporting purposes. They're called associates or partners, or you know, think about a bank. Everybody in a bank is a vice president, but selling is what they do for a living. So uh, this doesn't mean the disintermediation of the salesperson, but it does mean that what they need to do gets more specialized, to use your, your phrase. The other element that is important here is uh, the, uh, the data. Uh, again, selling is a more data intensive activities, what you do at Science greatly helps companies. You, among other things, you help them with lead generation. Again, 
very context specific. There are some businesses where basically the issue is generate more leads. More is better because the marginal cost of dealing with those leads is just not that high. There are other businesses where that is the kiss of death because if you can't qualify the lead in a long selling cycle business that demands perhaps multiple RFPs, a uh, significant customer education for them to understand value. In businesses like that, false positives can kill you. That leads uh, to uh, specialization as well. And then the uh, third thing is the interactions, which many businesses are only now beginning to understand, the interactions between online and offline marketing and selling activities. Measuring and managing those interactions is increasingly essential for sales success. So all of this leads to more specialization, more uh, division of labor. You know, it's funny, Frank, you hit on kind of a trend line that I would even make the, the argument is underpinning our entire business. In fact, we're betting on it. Um, not only sales specialization, but the increased need for human based sellers is one that, you know, we're, we're skating to where the puck is going, so to speak. I'm, I'm curious, um, cause you mentioned it, you know, the, the death of sales is greatly kind of like overwritten, isn't it? Yep. In, in popular perception. It is, but, um, yeah, what's the famous Mark Twain comment, uh, Eric, uh, prediction uh, reports of my death are grossly exaggerated. Right. This, uh, there's a long history. Uh, uh, about this. I wrote an article about this years ago, but if you go back to the 1930s, right? That was a long time ago. Sure. Uh, in the United States during the 1930s, the telephone system was still disseminating throughout society. And if you read Fortune and other magazines, the common prediction is that salespeople would go away because once we have phones, why do we need salespeople? I can just call up the company or the company can call me. You know, today we call that virtual selling. Well, it didn't happen. In the 1950s, you had a similar uh, flurry of predictions. The national highway system was disseminating throughout society. And again, people said salespeople will go away because, you know, buyers will just drive around looking for the lowest prices. Didn't happen. You may or may not be old enough as I am to remember in the first wave of the internet, we used to call that the information superhighway and it was the same set of predictions. What I think people ignore, and here's where I basically agree with your bet. Uh, and in, by, by the way, if you look at most of these so-called new normal predictions coming out of the pandemic, they're classic examples of this history of predictions. People ignore that buying and selling for millennia for thousands of years have been social as well as economic exchanges. And that's not gonna go away. I mean, you know, we're sort of wired that way as a species and the data I think supports this. Number of salespeople is increasing, not decreasing. The amount of commerce, e-commerce is a good example. E-commerce as a percentage of total retail sales the highest it ever was, was in the second quarter of last year, 2020. That's when we had maximum lockdown conditions in the US and most other economies. And as a percentage of sales, e-commerce was about 15 and a half percent. It's been trending down every quarter since then. When I ask MBA students and executives, what do you think that number was? I typically get estimates from between 30 and 60%. In other words, they're not just a little bit off, they're orders of magnitude off, but good managers never just follow the hype. Good managers, this is the great thing about business, unlike politics, right? In business, you can't ignore reality for too long. There is a market out there, it will bite you or hit you upside the head. This is what good managers have always done. Gravity still matters and AI bots coming for our jobs are uh, 
<laughs> Not going to take them anytime. Uh, that's very soon. well put. I'm going to use that. Gravity still matters. Good point. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, you actually mentioned, I don't want to steal all the secrets of your book, or I don't want to share them with everyone. You should all go and, and read it. But you do mention the story of Home Depot. And you mentioned how, I think it was around 2000, they got a CEO who came in and said, this is the future. We don't need salespeople anymore. The ones we have don't need to be that qualified. And, you know, they cut staff and you shared a lot of stats that basically sum up to me and they imploded like a dying star. And then another CEO came in, I want to say 2006, if my memory serves properly and emphasized the point of sale experiences. And lo and behold, there went the sales and stock price right, right back up. And the market spoke and said, we actually do want to talk to people who know what they're talking about. It, it's, uh, it's a learning that you shared with us. Yeah, and, and I'd go beyond that. I mean, I generalize a bit more. I mean, people forget uh, that uh, one of the biggest trends, even in retailing before the pandemic, was the move by once pure play e-commerce firms, right? Casper Mattress, Birchbox, um, Warby Parker, you know, all these companies that were only selling via e-commerce, they were opening stores and continue to open stores. Why is that? Again, the interactions between online and offline, which data is only now beginning to make apparent to people. Amazon, why did Amazon buy, buy Whole Foods? The issue is not will selling, will brick and mortar go away? The issue is the transformation of what those activities mean. You know, retailers have always been disrupted. It's always been one of the most innovative and volatile sectors of the economy. You know, I, I say this in the book, but I, I urge our listeners to do this. Go to a wonderful website, departmentstormmuseum.org. It's sort of like a, a little historical review of all of these retailers that were once dominant that are now out of business, but new ones came in. Again, it's both a social as well as an economic transaction. And those interactions are now more intimate between online and offline. Uh, it, it's not a digital eats physical world. That I think is a fallacy. Well, I'd love to even steer the conversation towards um, some of the topics that you just discussed and touched on lightly, because I think that there's some real insights lying below, especially when we think about you know, as you regarded it, our own enterprise sales development, mainly, you know, the, the front end, the top of the funnel, the folks that are in charge of outbound and starting conversations in this, you know, kind of like new buyer's journey where streams matter, where, you know, who plants the seed, who starts the idea, who opens the door to a conversation is one that we can be very strategic in, in thinking about, um, how we do that process. And I think part of being strategic is, is uh, again, you know, trying to maximize profitability, uh, understanding what it is we need and we don't need. And here, by the way, I think the pandemic out of necessity, Eric, opened many companies' eyes uh, to what they were doing in their sales model and what they could do differently. For example, I think the pandemic out of necessity demonstrated to many companies that in effect they were overpaying for a number of the tasks that you just mentioned. Lead generation. I don't need my most expensive enterprise reps doing that. I can do it. You know, I don't care whether we call them SDRs or oranges. We can do it with less expensive people and sometimes even with algorithms. Demos. We can do a number of demos online. Similarly, with meetings. I don't think that knowledge and insight is going to go away after the pandemic. I think the issue that many companies face, and again, uh, I know we're not here to, um, uh, to promote your company, but I do think uh, you help companies not only understand this, but more importantly, manage it. The issue, I think, is how do we integrate those approaches and technologies into what in many, many companies is for good reasons, an account-based selling model. You know, when you're a startup and the only way you go to market 
is through your inside sales SaaS model. That's one thing. But when you have to integrate that into an account-based model, it's not about the software. The software is the same, but it's a different buyer, different buying process, different activities. That's where the action is, at least in the companies I work with these days. And I think it's where the action will stay for some time uh, because it's, it's a much more complex managerial task than simply saying, you know, let's establish a website for e-commerce or, you know, let's, let's, let's have a SaaS model. Uh, it's not either or there, but it's when you have to integrate them that things get tougher and more complicated. You know, looping that back to one of the conversations we had earlier about hiring, uh, a lot of the people listening are enterprise sales leaders or building enterprise sales development teams, uh, in particular, I should say enterprise sales development leaders and building enterprise sales development teams. When they're thinking about building their force out and looking for the right people, yeah. what are the kind of traits that they should be looking for today versus 10 years ago, seeing as how that world has changed so much in all the ways that you've been mentioning so far? Well, again, I get back uh, to the basics, uh, as you know, Harry. I don't think the right way to think about this is to say, all right, what are the traits? The right way to think about this is, again, buying is what determines selling, or at least what should determine relevant selling. So what do we know, what don't we know about the important sales tasks? And by sales tasks, I mean, those things where our salespeople do have significant influence, as opposed to things that we really want to get done through marketing or customer success or product or whatever. You've got to begin from that understanding. And that's very, again, very context specific. It's going to, it's going to vary company by company. If for no other reason, then presumably they have different strategies, right? So that's that's number one. Number two, I think, is uh, clear out the garbage. Uh, sales hiring is a tough task, and many, many companies make it even tougher uh, because of uh, their own practices. Uh, again, you've got the data in the book, but um, the, the, the correlation between the evaluations that candidates get in their interviews and their actual subsequent job performance varies from about 0.1 to 0.4. In other words, even in the best of circumstances, it's less than the 50-50 rate of flipping a coin, especially when it comes to sales hiring, managers vastly overestimate their ability to judge somebody's future performance on the basis of interviews. Sales is a performance art. It's about behavior. It's not about how well somebody smiles in an interview. It's not about your assumption or my assumption that somehow we can peer into people's souls. We cannot, all right? So what you wanna do whenever possible, and by the way, this is much more possible than many managers assume, you always wanna put in place, not just behavioral assessments, but internship type hiring scenarios, other things where we can actually view behavior and not simply attitude or, or even you know, energy and motivation. And when I say that to executives, they say, well, it's a tough job market. How can we put in place internship, probationary hiring scenarios? And I point out that you're already doing this. If you look at turnover figures in sales, it's very high and, and you know it's gonna be very, very high in the next year to 18 months as the economy recovers because turnover in sales is always higher when people have more opportunities. You're already doing this, why not formalize it? If you hire, if you make a hiring mistake and most hiring mistakes are because if that person is a bad fit for the job, you make a hiring mistake, you're probably going to get rid of that person in three, six, nine months anyway. Why not make this formal? It's better for both the person hired as well as the company. So those would be some of the comments I'd make about, uh, about that question, Harry. Yeah, it's funny too, because the models that you're depicting are ones that 
frankly, we've, we've had a lot of experimentation, trial and error, and uh, a great deal of learnings from, you know, for example, at Science, you know, because we're representing such diverse clients, you know, from your Fortune 500s down to, you know, a couple guys still in the garage figuring out product market fit. And one of the things along the hiring lines that I think is really relevant is we have the ability to kind of what we call internally drink our own champagne, where we have our SDRs kind of cut their teeth with our brand and figure out that fit, figure out like whether or not, um, heck, this is even the right profession for them so that they have this kind of like model where they can almost train <laughs> um, before they're sent off to representing external clients, um, largely so that our clients don't have to learn on our dime. Yeah, for I think that's good. Dime. I think that's good practice. And I think more and more companies should do that. And um, among the reasons they should do it is again, sales is about behavior. Think about the typical interview. No one person, not even your future boss, can really tell you what it's like to work in a company. You only learn that by doing. So this is good for the person hired as well. The research about uh, sales in this respect, I think is pretty definitive. Most people who don't work out in a sales job, it, it's not because somehow they're stupid, but what they're good at is a bad fit for that particular set of sales tasks, not others. And what you're doing, I think, precisely because of the diversity of your customer base is in effect putting in a process that is basically a matching mechanism, right? Over time, you find out and the hire finds out, hey, am I best at these big companies or am I best at companies that are still in customer discovery mode? And that in turn improves hiring. You know, when you talk to sales managers, and you ask them, what are you looking for in a hire? With all due respect, what I have heard most of the time in my career, the only people who could fulfill their stated criteria are Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, or Michael Jordan. And you know, my advice to executives is, look, whenever you can hire Michelangelo or da Vinci, do it. You know, I'm sure they'll, they'll add value. But there are very few Renaissance men and women out there. And what you're doing, I think, is important because, in effect, it shapes the particular role so that you don't need Da Vinci, Jordan, or Michelangelo. You can hire someone who's not great, but they're more than good enough for that task. So all of these things, I think, interact. And good managers, you know, as you're suggesting, Eric, put in processes that help to accelerate these things. Well, it's funny too, the, the, the insight that I think is really the takeaway um, for this particular section is that having kind of a, a, a more regimented, structured, but easier path into the organization, right? Where, where frankly, it does come back down to dollars and cents and specializing roles and trying to get like, you know, more profitable assets into an organization so that you can grow and develop that raw material. Forgive me for speaking about humans as if they're commodities, but I think that that's the business mindset that we're really talking about here. Yeah, and, and I, I would be a bit more, uh, I'd be a little less apologetic about it than your tone of voice suggests, all right? I don't think people in business need to apologize for maximizing profitability. That surplus is what drives everything else in society, including the government. And secondly, I think it is very important to understand a basic fact about any for-profit business. And in the current environment, to be blunt, uh, I think we very often um, don't recognize this fact. The reality is that there are very, very few things in business that don't accompany profitable growth promotions, opportunities for advancement, the ability to get more responsibility. So whether that person stays with you or goes somewhere else, they're gonna be better off. All of these things are not possible without profitable growth. So maximizing that return 
is not only good for the company and its shareholders, it's good for people and it's good for society. Uh, I, I don't understand why we need to apologize for that. Fair enough, and, and good call out there because my, my tone was probably not as strident as it should be. You know, we, we have a talk track that I, I think you would probably agree with, which says something to the effect of when you're really thinking about outbound and breaking it all down to its raw essence, it's all about creating something from nothing. It's all about figuring out who are the individuals, who are the companies, who are those accounts in an account-based world that we would be a likely fit for our product or service to take that story directly to those individuals so that, again, where there wasn't a sales cycle born, there wasn't the seed kernel of an idea of doing business together, and now in a social and, and economic context, there is. Yeah. I, I agree with that. And, you know, it's based on what in, in different language, I think what you're articulating, Eric, is what I talk about in the chapters of the book about sales models, right? What's at the heart of any sales model? At the heart of any sales model is what strategists call scope. Scope is simply the strategy jargon for decisions that companies are always making implicitly or explicitly about where we play and where we don't play. Now, what one needs to understand in business is that scope decisions in practice are not made by a couple of senior executives getting off in a room and talking about it. That's called brainstorming. In practice, scope decisions are made as a result of the aggregate call patterns of the sales force where they do and don't allocate that time, attention, and money. And this is an area of business where you must be proactive. Because if you're not proactive, one of two other groups are going to make your scope and customer selection decisions for you, either competitors or customers. And neither group necessarily has your best interests at heart. The other thing that, that I would say is your point about the process, the process here is, is essential, right? Uh, it's, it's the only way to scale a business. This is the problem I'm sure you've seen again and again, as I do. I do lots of work with VC firms and their portfolio companies. But the problem there is what a lot of VCs call the Bermuda Triangle, right? You understand their metaphor, the company, the venture grows to a certain size, and then for some reason, it stops growing. And that's the lack of this scalable, replicable process, the company is basically relying on the heroic efforts of whoever those best people are. So their growth is bound by how far those people's arms can reach. So again, I, I agree with this. And I think it's, it's just fundamental, not only to sales, but to any coherent strategy in business. That's really interesting, just that perspective around scope uh, as a framework for how to approach the entire topic. Uh, you know, one of the other questions that we get very often, and this is something that we work on it every day, our clients are always working on it, are, uh, well, both ICP and really total addressable market, you know, deciding who are we going after in the first place? What does this look like? And, and there are so many different approaches to it. Some people, uh, feel like they have it locked down. Others feel lost when approaching it. So what are your thoughts on all of that? Well, let, let me, let me um, address total addressable market, Harry. And I want to get at it the following way, because I think it, it uh, connects to some of the other topics we're talking about, like customer uh, uh, selection, uh, targeting good lead generation. Now, the data I'm about to cite varies by company and by industry. But in the aggregate, if you ask yourself, how much time does the average salesperson spend in customer interactions? And by customer interactions, I don't simply mean, you know, uh, pitching the product either in person or online. I mean, all forms of customer interactions, webinars, email, demos, etc. In the aggregate, that percentage tends to be between 30 and 35%, right? Now, think about what happens in most businesses 
if you can make that 40%, 45%, hey, nirvana, 50%. Not only is that in most businesses a very, very significant productivity increase, it also increases that company's total addressable market because segments that were economically unfeasible at 30 or 35% now become economically feasible at 40 or 45%. So a very, very um, uh, important issue. And you know, quite honestly, coming out of a pandemic, there are not that many other things that are worthy of more attention by senior executives than this sort of activity. I wanna make so sure when- that point isn't missed. Because I think that you just said something that's absolute gold, which is that the size of a total addressable market really depends on how well you map your own sales motion to exactly that market, right? Especially in a specialized model, again, using our word of specialization, the amount of it bats, if, if you will, for my high paid, you know, <clears throat> for lack of a better way of putting it, closers can spend on calls with viable products prospects, um, talking about products um, or the fit they're in, that is really where, you know, kind of profit is won and lost. I, I, yes, I think that's well put. And I, I would, um, I'd go even a little bit farther than that. I think what you're seeing as uh, software increasingly becomes embedded in most products, you know, we don't even need a phrase like the internet of things to just understand that case. What you're seeing are basically business model economics that look more and more like some of the classic Silicon Valley companies. And in those companies, after product development is done, by far the single biggest expense is what accountants call SG&A, selling general and administrative expense, and especially the S part. So again, what you've said is correct. And it's a bigger macroeconomic issue and opportunity because software is, you know, now part of more and more and more products and services. And that has economic implications. It's amazing that what you're basically saying is that the effectiveness of your team, how good they are at what they do, actually affects the total addressable market and the targets they're going after because it affects the ROI calculation. And then expands that market for them. That, that's a fascinating perspective that I don't think many people take when they're looking at that market. They, they see it as a, a constant, not a variable. Yeah, I think that's well put. Uh, it is a variable. It, and it's a variable that obviously depends, again, on buyer preferences, buyer demographics. But, you know, my experience and, you know, once upon a time, guys, I'd look like Jimi Hendrix, you know. So, you know, I, I, I've got a fair amount of experience. But frankly, it is the rare entrepreneur who decides to focus on a small market. That is not where you know, brains uh, are won or lost. It's once we're there, how do we get to where we need to get? And that's the go-to-market process that we've been talking about. So I think that's well put. It's a variable, not a constant, assuming we've identified a real need. Uh, that's out there in society. Well, and it's even full circle because one of the things you said at the outset of this podcast was really around the differences of approaching and attacking different markets. And appreciation for exactly that is literally inherent to everything that we're talking about. The motion into those markets matters. Yes, it does. But here, uh, if, if, if I can editorialize a bit, I, I do want to point out something else to our listeners that, you know, essentially I talk about in the final chapter of my book. I think one of the better kept secrets about business is the very, very significant change that's occurred in the last 25 years in the uh, C-suite of uh, the global 2000. Everybody understands my jargon, you know, uh, C-suite is what we now call senior executives, CEO, COO, etc. Here's the data. The number of reports on average in those global 2000 firms, the number of reports to the CEO in the last 25 years has doubled, twice as many people. But then if you ask yourself, who are these people? 
Where did they come from? What were they doing before they became senior executives? This gets back to the specialization issue that you and Harry uh, mentioned earlier. The reality is that very, very few of those people were general managers, at least in the sense in which we use that term at Harvard Business School. By a general manager, we mean somebody who ran a line of business, had profit and loss responsibility. Most of them were specialists. The CIO, the CFO, the head of digital this, it's you know regulatory. Now, why is that? It's not as though companies wake up in the morning and say, whoa, Let's be, let's be more bureaucratized. That, that's not you know, what they're aiming for, but it gets back to all the trends we're talking about. Business is more complex. There is more data. It is more specialized. But that trend has two important implications. One is that the, the C-suite of many companies, ironically, look more like discipline-based universities. They're siloed versus people who are dedicated to the art of profit maximization. And the other implication is that fewer people than ever before have made it to the C-suite with prolonged prior customer contact experience. Now I sit on boards, I work with companies, and I can tell you that not enough senior executives know the questions to ask about their own company's sales model. And that's important. They don't need to know how to manage sales. You don't want finance doing that. But they do need to know the questions to ask about their sales models. And that, I think, you know, is a prerequisite for understanding what Harry was saying about total addressable market as a variable, not a constant, and other things. It's also obviously a prerequisite for putting together a market relevant business strategy. Big issue facing many companies. Do you see no, the, I... uh, the downstream implications of exactly this, this trend line that I would not only say your data is spot on, but I, I've witnessed firsthand with a lot of the companies that frankly we work with, um, where <clears throat> as those number of direct reports to the, the CEO grow, and the specialization and the removal, if you will, of a lot of the, the visibility into the buyer's journey That's and right. all of the company's motions. Um, to me, that almost suggests that's going to be a huge competitive advantage for those that do things differently, that view the world, you know, kind of almost the way it used to be. Yeah, but I think the competitive advantage is in processes and culture, let's use that word. You know the old phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's not true. Culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, all right? Um, it's also a set of processes that keep us in touch. You know, years ago, in one of the, um, the very first case studies I ever wrote at Harvard, a senior executive said something to me that it took me a number of years to understand the, uh, the street smart wisdom behind what he was saying. He said, Frank, you watch what you're gonna see throughout your career. Marketing and sales in most companies is managed the way it should have been managed five to 10 years in the past in that industry. Because that was the last time the people making the really important resource allocation decisions, the senior executives, had ongoing contact with buying as it really happens. So I don't think the solution to this issue is to get rid of the specialization. That's there. The world is what the world is. But what is under the control of managers are processes and data that keeps us in touch with that changing market. And then I think culture is important. You either, you either understand by the time you're a senior executive that we don't have a business if we're out of touch with our customers and they're buying or we don't. Uh, you know, that, that's, that, that's, that's something you got to come to class with that understanding or, you know, the class is just going to sort of go way over your head. So what advice do you have for the senior leadership, the, the C-suite executive that is maybe 10 years removed from how things actually work? How can they 
adjust accordingly? How can they they be up to speed or, or lean on their people? What can they do to make up for this? Yeah, well, you know, I I, um, I mean, the, the sort of thing I'm going to suggest sounds relatively banal once I suggested, but uh, you've just got to get back in touch. I mean, I always quote two things. Uh, one is uh, the novelist John Le Carre. I don't know if you've ever read his his novels. You know, the spy who came in from the cold. But in one of his novels, one of his characters says something that I think should be tattooed on uh, some prominent body part of every senior executive. And and what the character says is, a desk is a dangerous place from which to watch the world. All right, and, and that's especially true of the sales world. And frankly, think about this talk about big data, et cetera. Many executives really believe that they can understand their markets from their desks, peering at their laptops. Not true, simply not true. The other uh, person I like to quote is uh, Sam Walton, um, all right? Uh, Years ago, I wrote a book and admittedly I'm biased, but um, Walton was still alive and Wilmart was very generous in giving me access to their data uh, and so forth. And one of the things I did, uh, and Walmart at the time was famous for this, but Walton would run what he called the Saturday morning meetings. And what they would do is bring in their managers from around the country. They all had to fly back into Bentonville and they'd have a meeting from about eight in the morning until one in the afternoon every Saturday. And they would go through the business and they would set the bogey for the next week. And at the time, Walmart was growing so fast that the bogey for one week, seven days in the United States was often 200, 400, 500 million dollars. And Walton, who was, as we say, dumb like a fox, would end every meeting the same way. And I'm gonna gonna butcher his uh, noble Arkansas accent. But he would always, uh, after they set the bogey, he'd look out at his managers and say, now you all remember, you remember, if you're gonna make that number, you're not gonna make it hanging around my office. There ain't many customers at headquarters. And that's my advice to CEOs. I always quote Walton, there ain't many customers at headquarters. And by the time you're a CEO, if you really think that most of your people are giving you the unvarnished truth, you're, you're, you're much more naive than, than either you or I would have expected. You've got to get out there. You've got to get data sources that give you what's happening today, not yesterday. So Walden and Le Carre, that's your, uh, that's your advice for them. We'll have to get a book list for them. <laughs> Remember Peter Drucker, sales is the only, uh, how did he phrase it? Sales is the only revenue generating function in business. Everything else is a cost center. And I think Drucker was right too. Well, he we also of- said that the, uh, the object of any business is to create a customer. Yeah. Which yeah. is probably the best and most sage advice of all time. <laughs> We get a lot of uh, great sales development books for our listeners to read, but I think that's the first spy novel. So we'll, we'll add it to the list. Uh, well, Frank, we could pick your brain for easily another hour, but just want to say thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's very clear that you have learned a lot and that you have so much knowledge to share with everyone. Uh, I want to share one more time with our listeners. Uh, Frank's book is called Sales Management That Works. And uh, just want to thank you one more time for your time, Frank. Well, Harry, Eric, I thank you again. I thank you for the opportunity. I like what you do uh, at Science. And um, again, thank you for plugging the book. Uh, Your listeners, each of them should buy hundreds of copies. It'll make a great gift for the kids at Christmas. All right. But thank you very, very much.